Hello everyone, today we talk about the Ottoman Sipai from the early 16th to the mid 17th century. The Sipais were substantially professional cavalrymen, originally deployed by the Seljuks, so belonging to this older uh, Central Asian tradition, and later two types of Ottoman cavalry corps, the ones we discuss today. Uh, being made up essentially of the regular Capiculu Sipai, that is the palace slave troops. They contained Janissaries but also foreign noblemen not recruited through the Devashirm. And um, they, these were properly the um, regulars of the household cavalry, the Sipais of the port that, as we will see, will maintain on average uh, a higher uh, quality, especially in, in training. Uh, in, in equipment, but this thing can be partially debated. And then the thief holding provincial Timarli Sipai, that is to say, the um, larger but less well trained body of feudal cavalry scattered all over the, the empire, but mostly concentrated in Anatolia and Rumelia. Uh, the military traditions of which somewhat differed, also they evolved uh, in different ways, in fact, considering uh, Rumelia was bordering uh, the w Western Europe and uh, Anatolia, the Persians, so um, things happen at different paces and we will partially address this uh, in this video. Now, speaking of the Capiculu household cavalry, well, this was formed by six regiments of Sipais, divided into squadrons of 20 men each. The four oldest ones were known as Bolugs, but and in practice, when we consider the six ones, we're actually speaking of these ones plus some subdivisions of the respectively Olufezi, or paid men, and the Gureba, or known as strangers. The others were in fact known as Sipais and uh, Silidars, that is sword bearers. should point out that Sipai simply means soldier, right? But in this case, and par excellence in the Ottoman army, they it, it equated to heavy cavalrymen as a term. And when we think about the Ottoman army in the Renaissance era and also before, we think mostly as the core of the Ottoman force of the Sipais. And the Gureba foreigners were, as we were saying before, those strangers not recruited by the Devashirme, uh, but that were also, by the same uh, terminology, non Turkish properly. So recruited from Muslims from outside the same empire, right? And this was important because, as palace troops, the, the Sultan somewhat schooled the various uh, and co-opted uh, politically as, as a consequence the various princes, the youth of other Islamic powers that somewhat were in good terms or simply subjected to a, a, at a point to the same sultan. So these six, uh, four if more properly regiments of the Sipais were within the broader Kapukulu army that again was a bit, it was complete, right, on its own, as the Sultan's own arm, and uh, it was complete, especially from a tactical point of view. What is important to stress here is that the Sipais embodied the best of the uh, Ottoman feudal tradition, right? Some of them were slaves, of some, most of them, especially considering now the, the provincial ones we will see in a while, um, freemen, right? And as such, they also despised other type of troops such as the Janissaries that instead embodied a bit kind of the centralizing force of the Sultan that the uh, peripheral nobility was not happy of and that brought to an important difference also tactically speaking because the Janissaries were also complete tactically wise but as you know they were mostly based on infantry and on the increasing power of firearms that in the Turkic Mongolian tradition uh, were considered devils, weapons, um, the Tartars, the same Ottomans that somewhat revered the, the, the Mongol uh, 
oceanic uh, ruler's legacy uh, felt of, of these gunners to stink like the devil of, the, of sulfur. Um, and so there was kind of a, a Apollonian and Dionysian competition between these two elements that, however, uh, compensated quite effectively each other in the formidable Ottoman military. Um, and the Sipais, however, were the older institution, the, the most important one, in the sense also largely composed of, of freemen and of salary troops, as we will see now, because feudalism in the Ottoman Empire didn't quite exist, um, at least in the same um, Western standards of privatization. And within the four Kapukulu regiments, the most important ones were the, the one of the the Sipais properly meant, because the, the unit, as we've seen, was named like that within the same, still the same Sipais um, core, and the one of the Silidars, the sword bearers, and they respectively made up something um, like 3,500, 2,500 deployed, so respectively, on the Sultan's right, that was the, you know, the highest privilege in battle, and in fact the, la the Silidars latter on his left. Under Suleiman the Beneficent, so the peak of Ottoman power, the total of the Kapukulu Sipais were increased to about 12,000. Right? According to some sources, they were accompanied also by uh, armed mounted slaves and other field aid that could bring the wall number as high as 30,000. Um, the slaves maintained were in proportion to the pay the Sipais received. Um, for example, the Sipai regiment was supposed um, to keep five or, or six slaves for each cavalryman, whereas the Silidar one four or five, the Olufes is two or three each. The Gureba no, uh, perhaps because they, they already had some uh, resources uh, on their own. Um, then there were, importantly enough, and this also numerically constituted the, the bulk of the Sipai uh, force in the entire Ottoman army, they were the feudal uh, Sipais, right, holding estates on a non-hereditary basis in return for military service. And as we will see now, there was a proportionality between the military service owed to the Sultan um, and the size of the fief, right, the one, the, the, the Timariot, so the feudal Sipais with the smallest estates had normally to report for service with horse armor and arms of different types as we will see now uh, because there were differences not just on the size of the uh, based on the size of the fifth but also the local military tradition as we were hinting at before whereas the bigger holdings had to provide with uh, large retinues of up to 18 uh, so-called jabedlis that is, mounted men at arms with them. So as a sort of, uh, you know, company system, right, uh, like the lands, etc. And these troops were still, however, mounted, importantly enough, so that, as, it, as we were saying before, the Ottoman cavalry really was the main problem the uh, Europeans had to face. And the Timariot Sipais were deployed similarly to the Kapukulus in battle. Uh, one early deployment, for example, put a screen of Akinjis, um, so light cavalry in front with Azabs behind them. I made a video about Ottoman light cavalry and auxiliary troops during the same period, so you can check that video. I have a, a playlist on Ottoman warfare, uh, the Ottoman army. Uh, then further to the rear were the Janissaries and artillery, protected by field defenses of stakes, ditch, iron chains, and the war wagons. Then the defensive position was flanked by the feudal Sipais, by the Timariots of Rumelia, that is the European part of the empire, and on the other by those of Anatolia, with the Capuculo remaining behind as a broader central reserve, whereas at, for example, Moach in 1526, uh, even more depth was provided by putting both the Rumeliot and Anatolian Sipais in two lines in front and splitting the Kapukulu itself into two bodies on each flank of the Janissaries, right? So having still essentially a, a symmetry between the 
um, in terms of right and left wing uh, in depth of, of the entire uh, Sipai's forces, that, given that this was the entirety of, of the cavalry at that point. And speaking of the Timariotes, either the Sipais of Rumelia or those of Anatolia were given the place of honor on the right flank, depending on whether the war was fought uh, respectively in Europe or Asia, which naturally embodied per se the unification of the East and of the West, given that the Ottoman sultans bore among the other high-sounding titles, the ones of Roman emperors. So as we were saying before, the Sipais had a wide range of quality and armament reflecting the, um, their status, because they could be part of the Capoculo and in that case receiving the best panoply and, and training. Well, the, the Timariotes mostly relied on the resources provided by their fiefs that varied in size. And on the quality of the Sipais, we can evaluate the strength of Ottoman warfare throughout the centuries. Um, given the heterogeneity, especially the Timariot uh, Sipais, but we have to think that even the household cavalry was segmented in different ways to be, if anything, more tax tactically flexible, we can draw some different types of troop. The best one, the picked one, the elite, if you want, was made up of mailed horsemen with both light lengths and bow, which required uh, dramatic training. This could be uh, achieved also by the Timariotes, right? Just um, they were more and possibly they would even produce a larger amount of the superior um, troops compared to the Capocul. It's just the Capocul in that sense also had a, a broader esprit de corps, etc. and also controlled the the, the gate, the sublime gate, Constantinople, uh, and the palace. So um, they were more politically uh, relevant. But um, also their horses were generally barded, right? Um, and uh, this was a tradition also in other, in other countries that uh, the Mamluks had had their own uh, armored elite, also Persian lancers, Mughal, Mansabdar cavalry, as we have seen made several videos about Mughal warfare at this point, were kept like that. Then the, the average ordinary were still male riders, so heavy cavalry fundamentally, however uh, lacking either lengths or bow, so they would specialize fundamentally in one of the two, preferably, um, but they were skilled in technically in training with, with both, it's just that tactically speaking they had different functions and larger armies with a higher training tend to functionalize these tactical specialties. And they fought on unbarded horses at that point, so um, at some point privileging also the, the speed and so the missile function at that point. Equivalent at the time was Persian cavalry, the Polish Panzerny, also the Russian boyars, and uh, you can look at even more far east, um, this stamp tradition. Um, then there was a, a lower quality cavalry, mostly lacking armor and a supplementing sword, if at all with spear and javelins, um, or mixture of obsolete weapons such as bow, javelins, lance, or matchlock, as we will see the, the manner of firearms, as we were saying before, is, is relevant also in the broader reform of the Sipais uh, at the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century. And it seems, in fact, that matchlock spread earlier among the Timariot Sipais in the last years of the uh, 16th century, because these were uh, less snob in a way, but it had to do also with the, the role that the Capocul had in, in battle was kind of more privileged, and as we will see, also the Capocul would um, uh, be invested in ever less kind of military um, activities, which was a uh, a way the sultans were trying to substitute them with the Janissaries alike. Then there, there was also another type of trooper, and still mostly unarmored, but with very high morale, and supplementing expert use of the scimitar with pistol or an often carbine uh, later on, 
that began to appear also among the Capukulu after the first quarter of the 17th century and that had kind of this elite skirmishing function. As we will see the competition with the uh, Western gendarmes and uh, pistoliers was, was quite significant because uh, Ottoman cavalry lacked uh, firepower uh, compared to, to the Western one. This, this mostly relied on bows that were still for most of this time importantly uh, effective combined with the heavy cavalry uh, element. But still the Westerners were going ahead. Albeit, um, even in, in the 16th century Europeans, while considering their infantry superior to that of the Ottomans, which was true because basically the, the only bad arm the Ottomans had was, was infantry compared to the Westerners. They lacked mostly also properly effective melee troops to oppose to the uh, thickly packed um, pike squares. The Christians were fielding uh, conceded that the Turkish Sipai was the better cavalryman between the Westerners and the, the Ottomans, right? Which is meaningful and, um, and true because the equestrian tradition of not just the Turks per se, because who are the Turks actually? You know, speaking of the Ottomans, we're practically born within a, a West, the Western world, right? You know, the, the, uh, the Sea of Marmara had always been kind of Westerner, and there is not much of an ethnic thing. There were lots of Sipais that were also of Balkan, uh, European, Christian descent. Um, but um, the broader Eurasian steppe and the Middle East in injected continuously this kind of uh, equestrian culture within, this, especially in fact, those countries that lay east, right? Think about the, the Poles that at this point kind of uh, re-easternized their otherwise uh, by the late Middle Ages Western warfare to cope with the kind of warfare they 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 had to wage in Eastern Europe against the Tartars, the Russians, uh, etc. Um, and it, it's still meaningful, however, we'll see it also in armament, that the Ottomans and this were much more Western <laughs> looking in, in, in many ways, right? We have to think some using exactly the same Western armor at some point. And as you know, also the, the Central European Schatzkammer had filled with Ottoman armor because uh, German princes were radically obsessed with everything Turkish. The Ottomans had much heavier kind of infantry and, you know, as you know, also artillery famously enough and even properly heavier cavalry than their Eastern neighbors. And so they would look much more Western to them um, in that sense. And the uh, here we're talking also properly of an individual like Western culture. As we were saying before, the Westerners were actually developing a hell of um, cavalry tactics by combining the gendarmes slash lancers with the pistoliers, uh, the haitha initially with the caracol and then increasing during the 17th century, especially with the, the, the charge shock uh, effect, the shock element. Um, and the uh, the Ottomans seemingly were, you know, distressed by European firepower on horseback, as we were saying before. They could mostly oppose their own light cavalry and or, however, it's got kind of medium cavalry equipped with, with bows. Um, and the that, that was something else and um, was simply not reformable in a, in a quick time because this kind of provincial levy, as we will see now, was something very, again, heterogeneous, and the Timars were, were very different depending on which area of, of the empire uh, they were. Um, but in this sense, the tradition of, of shock charging was kind of more alive within the, in fact, the shock um, element within the the Ottoman cavalry that is normally the Sifais, uh, then among the, the Western one. So in, in combined tactics, this, um, you know, this situation was pretty evenly balanced, but the same Europeans, as we were saying before, accepted that the Sifai, as such as a feudal uh, uh, trooper on the horseback, was kind of better than the Western counterpart. And if you think about, for example, the, the Polish uh, hussars, Polish lancers, 
in the 17th century, well, you have a bit the same concept, right? This kind of re-stepification of the equestrian culture to the point that Polish cavalry, in some circumstances, would be able to charge even into the Western infantry pikes, not preferably, but, but with adequate softening up. But, well, this kind of proclivity to getting to grips with the enemy on horseback, kind of even having lighter mounts, at some point, um, was a big deal, right? The sepais were, as we've seen, segmented, and many of them were properly fully armored. Uh, but in general, we can say that the Westerners at this point had a bit more of metal on them than the average uh, Ottoman cavalryman. And so uh, you see this kind of steps, uh, uh, wild character just, you know, being habituated to, to charge and aggress, uh, even though firepower would keep them uh, at bay, right? It was said that uh, the properly the, the Sipais were in com unconfident, especially against musketry fire that was increasing, uh, becoming ever more powerful. As we've seen, they hated it also within their own their own army, their own same army, as they, they couldn't stand the Janissaries and uh, any other infantrymen at that point, even just the gunners, right, you know, the, 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 the it, it was just a bit like in the rest of, of Europe, like, people on foot were considered lesser human beings, right, and so uh, they embodied this great tradition that uh, to them was a big deal, because also politically they had a great impact on, um, on the Ottoman political affairs. Um, also, it should be said that the Sipai, however, could dismount, right, was able to dismount and, and passing to, to, to cold steel, right, to storm fortifications placed by the enemy, or even embarked on the Ottoman navy. In fact, marines uh, of the Ottoman Empire were mostly provided by Sipais, dismounted to serve aboard as um, bows. There were also Azabs and sometimes also Janissaries. Uh, this was still a time which largely, especially in the 16th century, uh, naval battles were just, you know, uh, land battles fought on vessels. Um, but, of course, the professionalism of the feudal knight was that high, of course, for employing, just like the Westerners did on, on board as well. Um, and... Again, all European tactical developments which arose out of the Turkish wars reflected essentially the Sipai threat and how to cope with that, not that of the Janissaries. This is very important to stress, right? Janissaries were quite flexible, they were tactically complete in many ways, but they mostly provided with this kind of um, final rank troops that were used importantly, especially in sieges, or also in open field, providing this bulk of the defensive um, formation that would pour uh, a, a hail of fire on the approaching enemies. But they were the ones who had to, again, stand the ground rather than. They were also fenders, as you know, they were also stormtroopers in many ways, but especially in sieges, right? With very advanced techniques, just like the ones of the Stoßtruppen during the First World War. But in open field, cavalry was still the thing, right? And speaking of mobilization, uh, one of every ten sepais was meant to remain at home to maintain law and order, right? So not like the usual road system where there is one guy out of ten that, that leads, right? These were a cold, kind of a mass altogether. You know, the Ottoman armies were pretty sizable, um, and they, they had all uh, a magnificent logistics and organization but it was also a bit let's put er, uh, everyone into this thing especially the uh the step starters that will pave um the way by raiding looting raping uh, uh, burning destroying whatever and then the rest of the army will proceed with it because they were bulky systems that needed many screen layers to proceed with this massive offensives right so this the idea that we have seen pretty often Western armies kind of kind of bulkier, kind of heavier, more compact, kind of more quality oriented, but in this sense also a bit more logistical and difficulty because of the general fragmentation 
of, uh, of politically speaking, and Machiavelli speaks beautiful, beautifully of this, which could pr provide, again, higher quality but lesser numbers, would be um, kind of enveloped and tormented and harassed by these swarms of light cavalrymen coming from who knows where at the Ottoman frontiers um, that, again, couldn't really break through because they were just light cavalry, but, but were these bulky armies for for long enough for the, the major Ottoman bulk to strike, right? And um, cavalry was decisive for the Ottomans at the time, but for, for the Westerners, it was infantry at this point that was decisive. And so um, that's why... Uh, eventually, like also the, the general outcome of the Turkish wars in favor of the improving of the pike and shot tactics, because also the Ottomans fundamentally had collected this legacy of, of easternness, if you want, where that, that, that was defeated elsewhere. Uh, think about Timotievich in Siberia with, with the Tartars, etc. I mean, the pike and shot puzzle was a very hard one to solve. Uh, even for such a powerful army like the Ottomans. And the main problem being, again, as we were saying, that uh, they had infantry, but it was not as good as one as, uh, as the Western one. So just with cavalry against infantry formations were primarily designed to cope with the heaviest cavalry. Uh, it was difficult to, um, to properly break, right? And so uh, the Ottomans were great, at least historically, a bit like the Mongols at enveloping, letting the enemy attacking like the heavier European cavalry as they had done at uh, Nicopolis, Barn, etc. Um, in luring them into the center with the Janissaries stood and but with the wings kind of enclosing on, on, on the flanks and um, but still essentially giving ground in the center, right? So um, this, these are very balanced um, tactical ratios that uh, are not like, you know, presenting you with the formula of winning all the time, right? Uh, they they don't at all, right? They are all balancing each other all the time. And so if one wins, it's that for that one percent increasing over the fifty that normally is uh, whenever somebody gives battle or fights a war in the first place in terms of, of the odds of how it's gonna go, right? Um, any case, um, the the CPIs. Um, leaving for 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 the army formed into ally regiments under their Serbashi, Subashi and Alabay officers. These are titles referred to essentially different types of uh, noblemen and or uh, governors of the of the Ottoman Empire that de facto controlled in fact the military force of the provinces and um, the officers would lead the troops eventually to the local Sanchak Bay, uh, that is to say that the local, the provincial overall governor um, that was provided with the two-horse tail standard of uh, Turkic-Mongol tradition was fixed right as a sign of domination. There, there are in Europe also some um, toponyms deriving from like the Sanjakate uh, connected to that. And uh, at this point, each Sanchak in turn assembled around the Belair Bay, that is the, the Lord of Lords, right, of the local uh, region, before riding to the Sultan's camp. Um, so uh, this was normally the, the hierarchy of, of command and how the, the army was uh, assembled. Um, after 1533, a new type of Timar was established along the Hungarian frontier with the Habsburgs, and instead of living on their feet, the local Sipais would stay in strategic towns like Budapest, Timisoara, Belgrade, Estergom, uh, where they essentially supported the local garrisons and, you know, integrate them with a uh, professional element. And uh, given that the area was quite unstable, and in general, however, the 16th century was a period of decline in the CFI fortunes. And this is a bit the trend, especially after the beginning of the century, where there was kind of a bit of back and forth in terms of, especially of organics, and how many Janissaries, how many CFIs it was. The 
um, number of the former increase steadily at the expense of the CPIs. Um, the point was that the majority of TMRs were now held by the Capiculu cavalrymen that were also not uh, properly there physically, right? Some were even sold to non-military men for cash, right? Stagnation and uh, retreat reduced the number of, of, of TMRs themselves, but not those who needed them. Um, so it was, they, they became kind of latifundia, like, whereas, you know, there, those who had to, uh, to, to benefit from that for, for providing with military service were just kind of speculating on them. And the fief holders began essentially to pay second-rate soldiers to serve in their place. Uh, and this is similar, in fact, to what we see in, in Western Europe with the speculation of regiments that where we, we talk about the Spanish rogue, etc. That was, you know, carried out by uh, essentially depleting the numbers of troops, right? They were appearing on, on paper rolls, uh, but they were de facto ghosts. So... Even there, before the France of Louis the Fourteenth, we don't see essentially anything like like a permanent professional army that also the Ottomans were trying to to create at this point. This is in fact the 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 core of the problem, and this is kind of the natural course that uh, the uh, after the expansional phase that the systems would undergo. Normally, this is kind of very typical of, of the Islamic system, with the exception of the fact. That the Ottoman uh, state, right, was much more centralized, and therefore, in parallel to this, there was an attempt to centralize further, cre creating a, a balance between the, the local tradition and kind of the this kind of also imposing project of, of statalization. And importantly enough, also to stress the kind of aristocratic nature of the Sipais, also as as corps of troops, we can. Uh, look at um, a standard Ottoman arming organic from a roll call held in Hungary in 1541. So reflecting the actual deployed strength of the Ottoman regular army forces, specifically because the uh, irregulars were practically uh, untrackable, as we were saying before, but participating in this campaign, registering, in fact, 15,612 men as present. Right Of these, approximately... Uh, 6,350 were Janissaries, 3,700 were Sipais, and another 1,650 were members of the artillery corps. Um, the remaining one quarter, so we're talking about roughly uh, 4,100 men, were mostly field aides, non-combatants. So we see um, almost half number of Sipais compared to Janissaries. And consider that Janissaries were fielded properly by the port, right? So whereas the Sipais were the sum of, of all the, the provincial forces as well. Um, and though substantially fewer in number, the Sipais cost the most to maintain. Thus, even relatively small reductions in their numbers resulted in significant savings. And it was useful for the Sultans both politically and economically, and also without uh, a radical military uh, change, uh, re reducing the CFIs uh, to, you know, to to improve their centralization. Uh, the fact that Janissary enrollments continued to increase over the course of the 17th century um, is not, in fact, from a fiscal point of view for the state, as significant as the sultanial success in achieving a steady reduction of the CFI enrollments, thus essentially excluding them from that gradually, surely, but also steadily f from that kind of establishment that they had embodied uh, back in the day and since the origins of the empire. So by the end of the 17th century, the annual cost of the treasury for salary payments to the Sipais had shrunk to about a half its budget-breaking levels of the early decades of the century. And the payroll re reduction technique of trimming the ranks of the senior officers in the two upper regiments of the top southern Sipais and, uh, and Siladars 
was far more effective and sustainable than any other military cost cuts, right? That would have otherwise impacted the steadily um, and directly maintained troops. Right? This is the important thing that the TMARS entailed properly a payment as well, right? They were non hereditary. So, yes, you had this money to give them, but at the same time, if you stop paying them, for, uh, you you would have just not lost locally too much in kind of kind of public organization and structure. Whereas you could save that money for improving the I don't know the the Janissaries core that as we know would also have their own problems. But the Sipais were the ones kind of declining earlier because they just embodied in a sense the older world, the one of of chivalry of 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 the feudal dimension, even of that properly in part that original ethnic pride of, of the freemen that had conquered and would receive you know land in exchange for for their own service etc um and uh Sipais were historically also the group most favored with assignment to remunerative non-combatant administrative roles the so-called divanisme or service in the name of the imperial council, but they were also, at the same time, most likely among all the Ottoman military ranks to become target of disciplinary action, right, demotions, and in extreme circumstances, even removal from the ranks and expunging from the roles, right, because uh, if this prestige that had maintained, as we've seen also with uh, a greater uh, statal expense for them over larger amount of troops entailed important expectations and exactly also the respect of those morals that the Sipai would have kind of had to embody um, historically. Um, so as the military group with greatest seniority and experience in the Ottoman army, the Sipais exercised considerable influence over the weaker sultans but periodically, and especially in the 17th century, when they, as we've seen, were kind of giving ground to the Janissaries, they faced wide-ranging purges, nothing short of purges, at the hands of more, you know, firm uh, leaders, such as, for example, the Grand Vizier Koprulu Mehmed Pasha, that we also discussed in our um, Siege of Vienna series. And so... We look at the declining military discipline um, of the core. Um, let's say we can't connect it also to the um, their gentrification, especially the Capiculu got ever more involved in politics. Um, the same Ottoman economy that during the seventh century, think about the War of Candia, you know, suffered massive strains, also undermined the Timur system itself, right, the, that had flourished as long as it was, it remained kind of this kind of uh, half-private system that could, well, you know, autonomously. But um, at that point, the Sipais very often could not even properly maintain themselves, what on paper roles were expected to provide in terms of revenues, equipment, uh, and properly military style, because if you grow... Um, uh, inefficient at that level, you will also lose kind of in absolute terms more than than the, in proportion what you you have been really losing because you cannot integrate any more comprehensively in the system as it was before. So this created an important erosion and attrition from from the within of the same military. Um, and as we were saying before, all sort of non-military people both their way in. Um, in this system, including the Janissary regiments, which after 1648 were not even recruited via the Devshirva system that um, had also become a much more civilized system than the early kind of medieval uh, robbing of children in the Balkan mountains. Very often it had, it had become kind of a, a voluntary system of people you know, of parents that also wanted their children to become Janissaries and maybe not seen them for, for decades, but given the amount of land they were rewarded with, eventually would have made them rich. So this is also 
um, we see the same process of gentrification at, at all levels uh, there. So while various sultans attempted to crush corruption, removing capable commanders and without untrained troops, such efforts um, to return to a, an earlier purity uh, of the system were nullified by the, the entropy of the same. And as you know, also in the 18th century, the reforming attempt kind of westernization of the empire was um, was uh, prevented and so the system began at that point to just to fall and uh, the Ottoman Empire essentially depending on, on foreign powers until the 20th century. Um, in this we can see also at a military level differences uh, on a provincial base. For example it seems that the Anatolian Sipais somewhat lagged behind in military technology, partly because uh, the, the the Near East was less advanced than than Europe at that point. So the the Rumeliot Sipais were just were declining, also because they were under heavy Western pressure, right? And you know that uh, in those years, many Western advisors uh, were called. Also, you know, there was a big deal of uh, exchange of you know selling of weapons, etc. Especially after the end of the Thirty Years' War, there was um, an important surplus that mostly was uh, sold, uh, discounted to, to the Ottomans. Uh, in any case, um, I made a video about Ottoman warfare in general and talked a bit also about this dynamics on the alleged um, kind of technical decline of the Ottoman army, which does not seem have been so as much as properly the, the cost and as always the political and social dynamics of the system because otherwise as the same Montecuccoli and he, he said that you know after the battle of St. Gotthard um, looking at Ottoman powder that in, in the boxes he had found the barrels he had found in the Ottoman camp ever having seized it was was excellent well we have to think that still the Ottoman military had maintained very high standards and surely did up to that point. And actually also the story of the Western technological advancement per se is equally false. The Westerners became superior because they became politically and socially superior, right? And technologically speaking, that was minimal, right? Uh, especially at the time where uh, the, the Ottomans, by the way, since the, the time, the granulation of power to the invention of the bayonet had basically led the entire um, pioneered properly the gunpowder technology innovation uh, throughout all the Turkish wars. So that's also another thing that we have to take in consideration. But we can conclude about the equipment that of the individual uh, suffice that is uh, very interesting as well. So as we've seen, weapons for all this cavalry uh, types comprised normally a light length, usually painted green with a pendant that uh, figures prominently also in the in the western stamps. Now composite bow, typical of the eastern tradition, the bow was carried in a case on the left um, and a quiver of brightly painted arrows on the right. Both cases were highly decorated. So if you look at many museums there are some you know almost incredible levels of um, you know, encrustment with, with uh, precious stones and so on. Of course, some of that is for parade, but again, the, the Sifai mentality um, and also properly the Islamic one in a broader sense in displaying material powers is, is enormous because it, it's considered like God's blessing, whereas, you know, in the Christian tradition you have to be humble. Um, and uh, everything you can display means God's favor fundamentally. Um, when the bow was in use, the lance was traditionally at least held between the rider's thigh and the saddle, point to the rear, right? It was a kind of also a kind of step practice. Um, a jewel scimitar was also carried with often um, a, a two foot javelin or Garrett or Jarrett, I don't know, as I said, uh, and a short steel mace, um, which again is pretty typical um, step panoply. Right, was traditional of the Turks at that point, the maze for also for closing in with uh, other armored cavalry and making blunt um, damage underneath the armor. The javelins too 
being functional to that essentially more even than 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 arrows. Uh, sometimes also a straight armor piercing sword like a stock could could be used right there, there was a, a huge variety if we were mm, you know opologically to describe the entire range of weapons existing within the the boundaries of the uh, enormously extended Ottoman Empire would never end but naturally within uh, the army you could find these things and just the fact that all these weapons seem to hint at a more kind of um, armored versus armored warrior combat tells you what what these men were uh, tactically conceived for. Um, as we we're saying before, the Sipai found themselves uh, unable to cope with the increasingly disciplined European infantry, armed with ever more effective muskets that increased the volume of fire, as always in volleys, and so. Uh, essentially reducing the the, the 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 balance that the that archery within uh, Ottoman cavalry could could respond with um, for this reason the same Ottoman government issued the sipais with uh, the equipment of pistols right but as we were saying before it's only after the, the beginning of the 17th century that um, sipais began to accept in consistent numbers such unchivalrous weapon. Um, firearms were literally considered very dirty and stinky and hellish and ketonic and proper of the inferior masses, right? And so uh, dishonorable. And um, and so like just like in, in the West, right? Initially just uh, these were two civilizations that had made a very quick and early and precocious use of firearms, but again, the, the use of the same within the, the military systems reflecting the political and social status of the owners were, were something was cared very much for. I made a video, for example, about the, the Renaissance, about um, uh, Bayard and uh, Ariosto, that you can check because it's basically that from the Western side. And in this sense, if you have a feudal system that dominates, a bit like in France, right? You know, think about how much the French lost, possibly the entire Italian wars, for not wanting to arm larger bodies of, of men. For, as professional native infantry, I made a video about that, the French infantry of the uh, Italian wars, uh, they, they, they would, you know, depend on the Swiss and other systems, but fundamentally, they, 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 they wouldn't unlock the massive demographic agricultural resources on France to, to field what probably would have crushed the, the, the German-Spanish axis right on, on the field. But uh, the French nobility could not conceive that happening from a political social point of view and having you know angry um, veterans from uh, the, the, the lowest classes uh, in France right, uh, with military practice next to, to noblemen where it was too dangerous. So a bit of that surely was present in the Ottoman Empire, except uh, the Ottoman Empire was much more of a an agricultural reality like uh, th than France. It was much more kind of bourgeois developing already at that time uh, in, uh, in, in trend. And, you know, southeastern Europe, Anatolia were you know, kind of much less uh, kind of urbanized realities. They, um, and th this makes the Ottoman gunpowder technology uh, upper hand over the Europeans for two centuries even more impressive if you think about that. Um, and consider the Ottomans had started basically with none of that even, but they quick, relatively quickly adopted it for these, for this kind of mostly the Janissaries, um, etc. So practically would adopt matchlock or carabine on, on horseback. Um, uh, speaking of, of shields, um, the Eastern cavalry would be round and up to about 30 inches in diameter. Um, the, um, in the early 16th century, the shield could be formed of cane rings bound with gold or colored thread right around a large steel boss later 
would probably be all steel, as you know, there was this phase in which they tended to, um, you know, still maintain some form of shield. Even in the West, there were some attempts to create a bulletproof shield, eventually, even for infantry, but they were abandoned because they cost too much. But this was cavalry, was a different thing, and it was often painted or engraved. And remember that the Ottomans, again, fought themselves against peoples that were very, very, very much like this type of more step like uh, cavalry. So they they were importantly coping with, with both threats, right, with the West and with the East. So finding these important compromises. It's, it's like uh, we were saying before think about the Polish uh, Lancers that had a similar uh, development, also a great deal of armor. Uh, of, uh, of Ottoman armor was spread uh, also among the Western armies and these ones that were kind of still more uh, cavalry uh, oriented. Armor as we've seen was usually worn in battle uh, and the typical styles are illustrated in the images that I have uploaded here. It was normally reinforced mail, right? Uh, horses as we've seen could also be armored, um, especially in the earlier part of our period because naturally firearms gradually uh, undermine the effectiveness and cost-benefit ratio of the same armor um, and um, they the, this this armor could be laminated mail also leather all being used right with plate for um, for the face uh, of the horse and or with the, there are all important styles that we will see now um, cloth trappings might cover horse armor uh, as well. In fact, we we also have uh, the same from uh, from from body armor like men armor. In fact, we have a few ornate textile armors as part of the Austrian loot from the Vienna campaign of 1683. Still, right? So this armor, often fabric covered, was part again also probably of the aesthetics. Of, of the Ottomans and the broader um, Central Asian tradition that they uh, had collected uh, in legacy. Um, but I don't think this that Westerners were less colorful or something. It was just, you know, different styles. Um, uh, the point is that the Ottomans, as we were remembering before, made also greater use of mail and plate armor than, say, the, the Mamluks that they conquered themselves at some point but maintained some distinctive uh, panoply and military tradition more in general and the same Persians right and um, so it's obvious that even uh, I don't know an, an Anatolian Timariot was uh, maybe less distinguishable from our, uh, our Rumaliot one but in general right and the reason being of course that the Ottomans had to face the Westerners that had a much greater amount of firepower for which armor for a while was kind of still the better the better answer especially for those professional troops that could afford such expenses um, the form of construction of ottoman armor probably developed out of laced lamellar armor or a typical eastern style um, but very different shapes of mail and plate protections uh, are to be found with different solutions both for cavalry and infantry. During the 16th century, um, infantry armor, however, was virtually abandoned, and partly because of the aforementioned rise of the Janissaries that had been armored in part, but tended, as we've seen, to increase mostly their firepower uh, through guns, and so um, at that point, it was more convenient, starting to be more convenient to keep the infantry with, with these guns that with with armor, right? That at closer range, especially would have uh, become, and given that infantry was also more slowly advancing, would have become less effective against the enemy. Uh, for cavalry, it, it was kind of different, given that also shooting at it was more difficult in volleys because cavalry simply approached more quickly, could also disperse in, in a more disorderly way. Uh, more quickly, equally, um, uh, and um, and generally speaking, this cavalry tradition, as we've seen, remained also in in areas that were more exposed to other type of that old cavalry tradition in the east. So there wasn't such a big need to uh, abandon armor um, uh, in those areas. The typical 
16th century Sipai armor was the so-called Corazin that naturally uh, suggests European origins, if anything of the term. Um, and the Corazin was, however, distinctively Ottoman in design. Uh, there was properly a, uh, for example, I don't know if you've ever seen it, I've uploaded one of these pictures, um, the so-called mirror armor was like a, a broad round chest plate with a very strong bulky center and kind of a elastic one on, on the sides that was distinctively uh, Ottoman in, in fact um, and generally speaking the, the Corazine was made up in fact of um, large steel plates connected by mail to form uh, an exceptionally mobile supple armor uh, and as we were saying before uh, there was only a gradual abandonment of the same. The, the so-called Zier male shirt, uh, the Colloc band brace, and also the Kalkan shield were still used by the 17th century sepies as uh, horse armor um, in general. And as we were remembering before, also the Poles did, and other um, more Eastern influenced military cultures. Um, speaking of the helmets, um, we mostly think of the earlier times uh, of the so-called turban type um, which may have been worn over a separate padded arming cap um, this would reach its full development in, in the 15th century in fact and it had an oven tail uh, so full male protecting the face uh, as well as the neck um, given that against archery this was the best solution right smaller helmets with integral linings tended to be similarly tall uh, it probably derived also from this kind of melee versus cavalry versus cavalry one could deflect better the, the blows um, and it's from this uh, from this style that in fact the typical Ottoman tzitzak one developed kind of more renaissance one pretty famous also uploaded some pictures here and in turn witnessing the Turkish influence of Western warfare uh, from the Tzitzak the German Zizsegge and the English lobster tail pot helmets evolved during the 16th to 17th century right while the Zir Kula uh, was incorporated uh, a small sh uh, shallow steel bowl to protect the top of the head and was normally worn under some form of turban. Speaking of the dress, um, aside from the, uh, the the fabric over armor we were talking about before, the sipais displayed uh, gr greatly their, their wealth, right? Uh, there are contemporaries mention of cloth of gold and silver even, as well as scarlet, violet, dark blue and green uh, with gold embroidery for the sepais of the port the Capicullu so to distinguish them from the others um, quite proudly um, naturally other vests such as jackets, caftans were were worn also over armor in a sort of Hussar style lace on the front this was also a typical Turkish uh, decoration it was blended even in here with other steps traditions and uh, that would influence also Western cavalry too, especially the ethnic elements of the Usars, the Ulans and so on. I made a video about that too. Trousers were baggy, boots normally yellow. Um, and when turbans were worn, they they worn they were always white, right? With a red or purple central cap and black feathers. Cloaks were also worn. Uh, they appear to have been often green, yellow for the 17th century Capuculum. Um, and some accounts seem to imply the wearing of some sort of uniforms, in fact, for the household troops. But um, feudal cavalry, the Simarios, wouldn't really have this kind of homogeneity. Simply, there was no reason nor, um, nor really you know, enough money to probably pay for all of them, given that they were already quite costly. Like um, the lighter Turkish cavalry, 
um, the uh, the the sipa is probably favored green or blue captains where these are normally the range of Ottoman colors um, but Turks also wore white yellow uh, yellow violet and mouse color black was avoided and purple was considered unlucky in battle I don't know why honestly uh, maybe because it reminded of the Byzantines joke but not so joke there were also ornate extremely ornate horse trappings with silver fittings jewelry um, very large fringe saddle clothes um, the step tradition had often overloaded um, the the horse bardings even with I don't know little bells things like these and because they had to evoke fundamentally the in a transcendental way the uh, celestial power true music right that was yet another Islamic and in this period also particularly Ottoman um, tradition from which in fact many uh, modern military musical instruments actually derive from the Ottoman ones who they were uh, the, let's say taken from by the Westerners from, from during the, the Turkish wars exactly because of this tradition I made a video about Islamic military music uh, during the Middle Ages that deals with this as well but let's say for today we stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested my upcoming contents and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye